I'm not sure if you heard, I would like to, to say good morning and good evening to all of our panelists and audience, depending on your time zones. It's already quite late here in New York. I would like first to introduce myself. I'm Kaliope Migiru, the chief of the Ending Violence Against Women section at UN Women and one of the co-leaders of the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence. I would like to welcome you today to this discussion on gender-based violence with different leaders from the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence. And also in the end of this uh, panel and introductions, we will have the opportunity to have a question and answers uh, session so we can hear from you as well. This discussion today and the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence itself are more topical than ever. COVID-19 revealed the extent of violence against women and girls and the failure of our systems to respond to it, especially for women and girls that who have been facing multiple forms of discrimination. But even before COVID-19, such violence was of pandemic proportions and of universal nature, as the recently launched WHO Global Estimates affirm, one in three women have faced intimate partner violence or sexual violence by non-partner at least once in their lifetimes. And unfortunately, such violence is starting early in the lives of adolescent girls. And these figures do not include sexual harassment as an everyday phenomenon in women and girls violence. We know by now that gender-based violence against women and girls is clearly a barrier to achieve overall gender equality and overall sustainable development. And we have seen that the other thematic action coalitions have reminded us of this fact, and they also took actions to address it as a barrier for realizing their own agendas. At the same time, there is hope, and we have growing evidence by now that gender-based violence is preventable. And we experience at the same time an unprecedented momentum to address it. Having gender-based violence been at the heart of high-level policy dialogues around the world, it is exactly this momentum that the Action Coalition is trying to build upon by bringing different actors to drive a global agenda with game-changing and catalytic actions that can accelerate progress in the next five years. We're having this discussion, we're having this generation equality forum starting from Mexico, moving towards to Paris because we cannot do it alone. So we really invite you today and throughout the generation equality forum to join this exciting and bold journey with us and to make commitments so we can make this ambitious agenda a reality. So that's why we're having this uh, discussion today. And before getting to introducing our different speakers and panelists for a very exciting discussion today, just uh, uh, a tech overview that uh, we're having simultaneous interpretation of the discussion today in all these lan languages. We have closed captioning as well as if you want to raise some questions, you can enter them in the questions and answers box. And then we're going to address at least three of them, depending on the time we have available later in, uh, uh, in the end of our discussion. So without any further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Ms. Hannah Christians Dote, Senior Advisor on Women's Leadership, UN Women, and at the Action Coalition Secretariat. To give us an overview of this exciting Action Coalition journey so far, you're having the floor, uh, Hannah. Thank you so much, Kaliobi, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. So great to see you, and thank you so much for joining us on this important route. We're discussing now the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence, but all through the day we have been having these really, really exciting uh, 
uh, discussions around the Action Coalition. And this is why I would like to start by thanking our leaders, the leaders of the Action Coalition for Gender-Based Violence, and all the work that they have done to make sure that we are now uh, making, uh, sort of introducing these things in Mexico and that we can move further with these pressing issues. I would like to just uh, frame for us uh, a little bit the fact why we are here. I mean, the simple reason behind the Action Coalition as a whole being launched is the simple fact, and of course, the sad fact that 26 years after the Beijing Platform of Action, not a single country in the world, not even Iceland, where I am located now, uh, has achieved gender equality. This is the status of the world in 2021, and this is why there is pressing need for urgent actions, funded and game-changing actions. And also in light of COVID, of course, this action coalition has become extra urgent. It is called within the UN system, and our ED has again and again mentioned this, to be the shadow pandemic of what we're experiencing today. So these are seriously urgent actions that we are, we are calling up on here tonight. I would like to draw your attention to the slide that is in front of you. This is us trying to make sure that you get great clarity on what the action coalitions are, what has been the journey of the action coalition and where we are moving. And as you can see, this started uh, over a year ago when the co-hosts, France, Mexico, UN Women, civil society centered and youth uh, uh, centered as well, decided that generation equality as a campaign and as forum was desperately needed in order for us to move from only words to actions. And this is when the action coalitions were decided and they were and are to be real funded and as I said earlier, game changing actions. And after a lot of co-creation, partnership and co-ownership around the whole uh, journey, we came up with six themes or you came up with six themes, themes, our partners and all of those around the world that has been working around generation equality. We have six themes. One of them is on gender-based violence. And we have then moved on these themes with leaders. We have 95 leaders uh, in the Action Coalition. We had over 2,000 letters of interest. That is uh, institutions, international organization, youth-led organizations, civil society, member states, governments, and private sectors that actually wanted to become leaders. There were 95 selected, and they have been working hard for a year now to make sure that we, uh, there is a consensus around the actions that we will be introducing to you now. So they have all uh, developed and found consensus around 24 game-changing actions in total, four for this action coalition. And this is what we would like to introduce to you today. I would like to just uh, end on the note that we will, of course, be showing you in the end, after we've had the fruitful discussion here today, we will be making sure that we show you the journey from Mexico to Paris uh, next summer and what we are hoping to see via commitments and, and, and all of those that want to join forces with the Action Coalition in making sure that we change the world for all women and girls. And of course, that is the mission of this journey. I'm wishing all of you a fruitful and enlightening discussion and giving it over to Calliope. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Hannah. That was really informative. And now I would like to, to move to our next uh, speaker, I have the pleasure to present the EU Commissioner Jutta Jurpilainen, Commissioner for International Partnerships at the European Commission, in order to provide us an overview on the theme, why gender-based violence and why now? Let's watch the presentation.
Frida. With strong multilateral action. Let's build bridges, join efforts and commit ourselves to do more. Let's strengthen partnerships with governments, men and boys and civil society. Let's listen, support and work closely with women's movements and youth organizations. EU is ready to lead by example. We're having some technical difficulties with the sound. I'm, I'm not sure if you, if you could fix it, please. Now is the time. We are calling on every. COVID-19 has disproportionately affected women in many ways. The shocking rise of women and girls experiencing sexual or physical violence over the past year calls for immediate and strong action. The EU is proud to co-lead the Action Coalition of the Generation Equality Forum. With strong multilateral action, we can put a stop to this shadow pandemic. Let's build bridges, join efforts and commit ourselves to do more. Let's strengthen partnerships with governments men and boys and civil society. Let's listen, support and work closely with women's movements and youth organization. The EU is ready to lead by example, including via the EU UN Spotlight Initiative. We believe in a transformative and comprehensive approach which puts survivors first. One year since the pandemic began, now is the time. We are calling on everyone to commit to action. I would like to, to thank um, the commissioner for this really good uh, presentation and for reminding us the importance of multilateralism especially during these uh, times, and also the fact that we need gender transformative approaches in order to, to have sustainable results to end violence against women and girls. I would like now to um, invite, um, I would like to confirm, first of all, if our executive director of UN Women is here with us. Otherwise, while we're waiting for, for her to, to join us, I would like to, to move next to my colleague, Gabrielle Henderson. She's the thematic lead of the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence. She's UN Women uh, staff. And thanks to her diligence, excellent technical skills, endless hours of work on very complicated technical issues, she managed to get all these action coalition leaders together and uh, finalize the blueprint that she's going to present us right now. Gabrielle, over to you. Thank you, Calliope, and um, greetings to everyone. Good evening, good morning, good night. Um, great to be here with you today. Uh, and I, as Calliope has indicated, I will present the draft blueprint of the Action Coalition on GBV. If we can have the slides, please. Thank you. Uh, the leaders of the Action Coalition of GBV have established a vision of success for the Action Coalition, which adopts a comprehensive approach, which centers survivors of violence and which is applicable to addressing all forms of gender-based violence against women and girls in all their diversity. Some key elements of this vision include that leaders and commitment makers make and implement concrete new comprehensive commitments to address gender-based violence against women and girls in all their diversity. 
ensuring coordinated scaled up global action, which builds political will and accountability, ensuring that girl led and women's rights organizations are recognized for their expertise and well resourced ensuring that an intersectional evidence-driven approach is consistently integrated into all efforts to prevent and respond to GBV. I will now present the draft action statements, their related tactics, and some of the targets which make up the key elements of the draft action coalition blueprint, which you may also find in the virtual exhibit hall. The first action statement of the GBV Action Coalition is that more states and regional actors ratify international and regional conventions and public and private sector institutions strengthen, implement and finance evidence-driven laws, policies and action plans to end gender-based violence against women and girls in all their diversity. This will be achieved through advocacy for ratification as well as actual ratification and implementation of international and regional conventions and strengthening and implementation of laws and policies in both public and private sectors. Also through increased financing and budgetary allocation for gender-based violence prevention and response in domestic resources, both government and private and in overseas development assistance budgets and through improving the production, availability, accessibility, and use of quality data and statistics on gender-based violence. Some of the game-changing results that we expect to achieve through the many commitments to this action coalition include that 550 million more women and girls will live in countries with laws and policies prohibiting all forms of GBV that 55 more countries will have no exceptions to legal age of marriage, along with policy measures to end the practice by 2026. And three quarters of countries where female genital mutilation is known to be practiced will have legal prohibitions and policy measures against FGM also in place. Also, that at least 4,000 private sector organizations will adopt and implement GBV policies. The second draft action statement of the Action Coalition on GBV is the scaling up of implementation and financing of evidence-driven prevention strategies by public and private sector institutions and women's rights organizations to drive down prevalence of gender-based violence against women and girls in all their diversity, including in humanitarian settings. This will be achieved through context-specific adaptation and scaled up implementation of evidence-driven prevention strategies, which address social and gender norms, harmful masculinities and harmful practices. It will also be addressed through adoption and implementation of policies and legislation that aims to shift inequitable social and gender norms through increased financing for scaled up evidence-driven prevention strategies, including practitioner-led strategies, and through work with the education sector, ensuring that schools and educational institutions are safe for girls, including through prevention strategies, gender sensitive curricula and comprehensive sexuality education. Some of the game changing results that we expect to achieve through the many commitments to this action include to increase by 50% the number of countries that implement one or more evidence driven prevention strategies on gender based violence to increase by 25% the number of people who endorse gender equitable beliefs in every country, and also to increase investment in evidence-driven prevention strategies by at least $500 million. The third draft action statement of the Action Coalition on GBV is the scaled up implementation and financing of coordinated survivor-centered comprehensive quality accessible and affordable services for survivors of gender-based violence against women and girls in all their diversity including in humanitarian settings this will be achieved by increasing awareness of and access to coordinated police justice health and social services including for adolescent girls and young women in particular and in response to covid19 
also by increasing public and private financing and gender responsive budgeting to ensure scale up of multi sectoral services by strengthening coordination and multi sectoral service provision and application of accountability mechanisms to ensure adherence to agreed global standards of service provision. Also by strengthening capacities, leadership and accountability of police, justice, health and social service institutions and preventing re-victimization and impunity. Finally, under this sub-theme, also by building specialist GBV expertise in humanitarian emergencies. Some of the game-changing results that we expect to achieve through the many commitments to this action coalition under this sub-theme include that more women and girls will live in countries with GBV-related police, justice, health, and social sector services, and that 100 countries will build capacity of law enforcement to address gender-based violence. Lastly, the fourth action defined by the leaders of the Action Coalition on GBV is to enhance support and increase accountability and quality flexible funding from states, private sector, foundations, and other donors to autonomous girl-led and women's rights organizations working to end gender-based violence against women and girls in all their diversity. This will be achieved through increasing funding from private sectors, foundations, states, and other donors, supporting institutional strengthening and programming capacity of girl-led and women's rights organizations, and strengthening the accountability of public institutions and private sector organizations to women's rights organizations to ensure their increased leadership and participation in decision-making at all levels. The key game-changing results that we expect to achieve through the many commitments to this action coalition under this sub-theme includes a doubling of national and international funding to women's rights organizations, activists, and movements working to address GBV against women and girls in all their diversity. I thank you and hope that you will make commitments and join the leaders of the Action Coalition on GBV in this bold, ambitious, and urgent vision to prevent and respond to gender-based violence against women and girls in all their diversity. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, for this excellent overview of the blueprint. I hope we gave our audience uh, how comprehensive this uh, framework is and also an indication of the extent of our ambition in order to accelerate progress in the next uh, uh, five years. With uh, the presentation of uh, the blueprint by Gabrielle, we are entering, we finished the presentations and the speeches, the introduction, setting the stage for this dialogue. And now I have the pleasure to introduce uh, the panel for the next uh, segment of this uh, discussion and to uh, start and to start also uh, with the first pa panelist another action coalition leader from the government of Iceland Mr Gudlogor Thor Thorthason Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Development Cooperation of Iceland I would like to uh, pose the question to Mr. Thorthason. What will it take to prevent and ultimately eliminate gender-based violence against women and girls in all the diversity by 2030? And how will this action coalition accelerate progress towards this? Let's see what he had to share with us. Can we share the presentation, please, of Mr. Thorthanson? Thank you, Chair. First, let me express my gratitude to the government of Mexico and the UN Women for hosting this forum and giving the leaders of the Action Coalition an opportunity to highlight our work. Violence against women and girls is one of the most prevalent human rights violations in the world. Unfortunately, 
we have seen it escalates further during the COVID-19 pandemic due to increased risk factors for gender-based violence. This is truly a shadow pandemic. It is therefore of utmost importance that we work together in partnership with diverse stakeholders to safeguard the hard-won gains for gender equality and accelerate progress. Precisely what generation equality is about. With the SDGs, world leaders agreed on the urgent need to eliminate all forms of violence against all women and girls in public and private spheres. Not only is this an essential objective in and of itself, but it's also clear that it will lead to the advancement towards other development goals, such as health, social cohesion and economic empowerment. Progress on this front is therefore transformational. But to eliminate gender-based based violence, we must address its root causes, including by challenging gender power dynamics, discriminatory norms and stereotypes. Early intervention is a key element in this regard. Through education, young people need to be informed of their rights and paths of recourse. They also need to be equipped with the knowledge and skills to understand and analyze social norms and respectful relationships. It is also critical to engage men and boys in prevention efforts and especially in our work to change social norms. Prevention strategies and policies that engage men and boys to shift attitudes and behavior can bring about meaningful change and have a long-term effect for the future. Men must contribute to the solution. After all, gender equality and women's empowerment benefit everyone and lead to greater prosperity for the whole of society. Lastly, I would like to emphasize that with this action coalition, we have an opportunity to join forces with multiple stakeholders and work together in partnership towards innovative actions to drive transformative change. I believe this is what makes the concept of the Generation Equality Forum unique and the global conversation we must have on urgent actions is critical. Iceland remains fully committed to offer concrete steps towards progress and we urge others to do the same. It is important that we stand together now more than ever to counter stagnation and the risk of setbacks in global efforts in this field. Thank you, Mr. Minister, and also for um, emphasizing the fact that if we address violence against women and girls, we're going also to have an impact on addressing progress in other SDGs, such as health and education, and also emphasizing the importance of engaging men and boys in comprehensive prevention strategies to address harmful social norms and gender inequitable norms that uh, uh, normalize and condone violence against women and girls. Now I would like to move to the next uh, uh, panelist. And uh, is uh, this uh, time Ms. Tina uh, Famosa, who's from another action coalition leader, Yes Trust, Zimbabwe. And I would like to pose the following question to Ms. Famosa. At this Generation Equality Forum hosted by the government of Mexico, a global call for commitment to the Action Coalition has been made. Why, Ms. Famosa, is it important now for diverse stakeholders, including civil society, youth organization, member states, private sector, philanthropic, cultural and faith-based organizations to join the Action Coalition on GBV as commitment makers. Let's listen to Ms. Famosa and to her reflections.
Can we please uh, see the presentation of Ms. Famosa? Mafosa, sorry. I'm afraid we're having a technical... My name is Tina Mafosa, the spokesperson for Yes Trust in Zimbabwe. I'm responding to question number four. And yes, it is important for all stakeholders to make commitments to end violence against women and, and girls globally. It is also important for youth-led organizations to also heed to the call to end violence against women and girls. All these stakeholders are important on this call because this will strengthen partnerships, this will strengthen networks, this will strengthen the, the multi-stakeholder approach to ending gender-based violence against women and girls, as well as building on stakeholder smart and different um, uh, comparative advantages in ending violence against women and girls. It is also important for youth-led organizations, young people-led organizations, girl-led organizations to make commitments to end violence against women and girls because they are the future, they are the majority, they have the creativity, they have the innovation, and yes, they are an important stakeholder to end violence against women and girls. And yes, with the commitment from young people and their organizations, we may see a future where we have violence-free communities. Commitments by all stakeholders or commitments by multi stakeholders reveals the seriousness of the call to end violence against women and girls globally. Thank you. Thank you so much for these very uh, important uh, uh, reflections that you have just uh, shared uh, with us. And now I would like to, to move to our next uh, uh, panelist and to uh, hear from Mrs. Nicolette Naylor, the International Program Director of Gender, Racial and Ethnic Justice Department at the Ford Foundation, who's another action coalition uh, leader. I would like to pose to Ms. Nicolette Naylor the following question. What do you think is needed to make this action coalition a success? Over to Ms. Naylor. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Since the development of the Beijing Platform for Action in 1995, Ford Foundation has continued to support the amazing work of women's rights activists around the world in their quest for gender equality and ending gender-based violence. We also know that now is not the time to retreat on our commitments to fighting gender-based violence. In fact, we need to double down and recommit ourselves to the elimination of gender-based violence. So in 2019, we committed to spending over $78 million to address gender-based violence in our international programs. But we also realized that no matter how much resources we have, the philanthropy community and the Ford Foundation can never solve the problem of GBV on our own. And that is why we believe that for this action coalition to be successful, we have to prioritize more and better partnerships, coordination, and collaboration between the philanthropy sector, governments, bilateral and multilateral agencies, and the private sector. COVID has taught us that we have to push ourselves to be more coordinated and work in partnership. And these partnerships have to be supporting the vision of survivors, activists, and movements of women and girls. A transformative approach to partnerships also requires us to be firmly feminist, explicitly intersectional, and truly global and driven by the evidence base that exists on how to prevent gender-based violence. We also have to build international solidarity and international cooperation and see this as a powerful force for change. 
what we need to do is to think globally and redefine and reimagine the connections between the national, transnational, regional, and global, if we are to strengthen the multilateral processes and accountability. Because we want all stakeholders to be accountable to survivors of violence. And to do all this, we have to address the severe funding gaps that are preventing us from reaching the scale of programming that we need. This means we have to ensure more financial resources are actually going to women's rights, feminist, youth-led organizations, as well as women's funds in the global south. As governments put in place economic reforms, we have to make sure that we're taking into consideration adequate resourcing and budgeting for GBV at the highest level. Because we need political will and leadership to drive the change that we want to see around the world. Lastly, we also want to see better coordinated efforts across the six action coalitions because these issues are all interconnected and success depends on us breaking down the silos that often exist in our work and that may come to exist between the different action coalitions. I thank you. I would like to, to thank Mrs. Uh, Naylor for this uh, very important reflection, and she's especially for reminding us that coordination has been a critical gap for achieving results and sustainable results for ending violence against women and girls, and how important it is to have political will at the highest level to achieve this kind of coordination and work, and uh, also to strengthen collaboration, but nothing would be really possible if we don't have the adequate resources and funding for this kind of work, especially for women's rights organization and movement. So now we have a fun um, exercise for, for our audience in order to um, uh, interact uh, with you. We're having a quiz. And uh, we would like to, to bring some questions for you up on the screen. Can you please uh, present the questions? And in the meantime, while you are doing that, I'm watching Lisa, our uh, graphic designer, doing this amazing work reflecting on what we have been discussing so far. I've seen some of her work before. It's very, very impressive. Lisa, thank you so much for, for what you're doing for us. So the first quiz is, if you can uh, think and share your reflections about successful strategies to prevent women require uh, interventions to check all that apply to multiple choice. A, transform harmful and unequal gender and social norms. B, prioritize campaigns to raise awareness about the harms of all. C, work across sectors in implementing combined strategies. D, prioritize interventions aimed at perpetrators of violence. E, work throughout the life course and start early. So go ahead and vote, the, and then we can share the, the results. While we're waiting for the results. Are the results ready? Hopefully it's going to work. Technology is going to work for us. Okay, so now we're having the, the results. And the, the first answer is work across sectors in implementing combined strategies. Of course, we heard from Nicolette Naylor how important it is in order to have a multi-sectoral approach in order to have the results and uh, sustainable results. And then the, the second answer, it's a transform harmful and unequal gender and social norms. We heard from all speakers and panels so far how important it is to have gender transformative approaches to the work we do and addressing harmful social norms is center and key for our, um, for our prevention uh, work. I see that the prioritized intervention saying that perpetrators of violence, um, it didn't get a lot of votes. Um, 
we have conflict, conflicting evidence how uh, promising these interventions are for perpetrators programs. And uh, they could be in some context be successful, but there is conflicting evidence and they need to be integrated into a broader response and prevention strategy to address violence against women and girls instead of addressing them in isolation. And we have also the other part, prioritized campaigns to raise awareness about the harms of war. They didn't get uh, a lot of votes because we know by evidence so far that campaigns, campaigns awareness raising campaigns can play an important role to raise awareness, but as standalone activities cannot bring the transformative change that we would like to see, and they need to be a part of a comprehensive prevention strategy. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the audience for these very good uh, answers. And now I would like to uh, move to our next uh, panelist, another colleague of mine, Mrs. Aldiana uh, Sisic, who's the chief of uh, the uh, tra UN Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women and Girls, and who has also worked with us to finalize this uh, um, blueprint. And Aldiana, if I can pose the following question to you. Why is it so important to support girl-led and women's rights organizations and movements to end gender-based violence against women and girls in all their diversity? What type of support is needed? Over to you, Aldiana. Thank you so much, Calliope, and good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. What a great pleasure to be here in this virtual space with all of you. And I don't know how, but I feel an amazing energy of this forum. And I could talk uh, a lot um, about how excited that I am that despite all the challenges we have and are still facing, the forum is taking the place and how thankful I am to be involved and uh, how thankful I am to everybody who has been working very hard to make this happen. I think that in itself speaks uh, about our collective commitment and determination to work together and to build better, just as the previous poll has shown importance of that. Um, I would like to put forward two points. And if you don't mind, Calliope, um, I'm going to turn your question a little bit around and I, and I hope you'll forget me, forgive me about it. Um, I think that we really need to change the narrative to start with, and we should not be asking this the why question anymore. Abundant data shows, including the practitioner-led evidence data that we receive in the Trust Fund and Violence Against Women from our grantees, that the most effective way to advance women's rights worldwide is to invest in the civil society organizations, particularly women's rights organizations and women's movement. It is them, actually, who often make a difference in saving a woman's or girl's life um, and saving them from violence and abuse, COVID or, or no COVID. During the COVID, we all bore witness to the lack, lack of sustainable structural social support mechanisms and frameworks that are crucial for the work on preventing and ending violence against women and girls. And we have also all witnessed in the past years, once again, it was civil society and women's rights organizations in particular, who have been the first responders and service providers who filled this gap. So I'm not going to talk about all the details of that work because colleagues before me have very, um, you know, abundantly outlined all of that. But I, I really think the question why needs to go. Um, one more related point on, on this narrative. All of our conversation about violence against women and gender equality are often structured around masculinity, femininity, survivor and perpetrator and patriarchy. But while all these conversations of course stand and they all have a very valid points and importance. However, we must not forget that in its roots, patriarchy and gender equality are not simply just about men and women or any individuals. Gender equality is about diversity, it's about tolerance, um, about respect and equal access to opportunities. And this requires more of just an equitable distribution of power and of resources 
in the intimate realm as much as in the public domain. So this takes me to my second point. The question is not why anymore. The question is how. In all our discussions on preventing any violence against women and girls, we often hear about need to invest in building capacity of civil society organizations and women's rights organizations. I have been listening that line for a long time now, I won't say how long, uh, uh, since I've been engaged in this work on human rights and specifically on violence against women. And during the forum in a number of events, I've heard it about importance of building capacity of women's rights and civil society organizations. So I'd like to highlight a um, few points and, and raise some questions. There's indeed lack of capacity, and we see that in the UN Trust Fund and Violence Against Women, when we speak about particularly small women's rights organizations, we, we hear about the challenges around the capacity. Overall and globally, I think building capacity of civil society and women's rights organizations is probably the main activity, output, outcome, however you call it, in everybody's strategy, project plan, results framework, and we will find it probably, if we were to do it global review, we will find a pattern there. So my question is, if we are all investing and working on this already and for quite a while, why are we not resolving this issue faster? Why are things not changing faster? Why is capacity not built faster? And why is the issue of violence against women and girls still far from being resolved? And I would suggest that it is because overall, we are not intentional enough in providing adequate resources and building institutional core capacity of civil society and women rights organizations. If we all agree that the solution is to center our work on women and girls, that ultimately means significantly increasing resources, including long-term general and flexible operating support to civil society and particularly women's rights organizations for their own context and demand driven work and projects. And let's not forget, you know, that the, this lack of capacity also comes from the same concept of power that I have just mentioned earlier. And this is why um, I'm really inspired, energized and really proud of our work in the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence, as well as of our colleagues in the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership who have also recognized and specifically addressed the need to change the narrative from why and focus really on how. And we have identified some hows, as you would have seen from the blueprint. And we set target to double resources for civil society and women rights organizations and a very clear focus on provision of flexible and core funding. I believe that it is in this way that we will create this mutually enabling environment for effective and long-term on um, to prevent and end violence against women and girls to transform their own communities in a longer term to end patriarchal oppression. And I hope this answers your question, Calliope, even though I've changed it a little bit around. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Aldiana, for the thought-provoking response. I really like the idea that you reverse the high, the why to focus on the how instead, because I think it's very, very important. And this is exactly what we are trying to achieve through the action collisions, as you uh, highlighted, and through the blueprint and the specific actions that we would like to see, and the commitments that we are trying to elicit from different commitment uh, uh, makers. I also like the fact that you emphasized the fact that we need to consider the context and the demand coming from um, women's organizations and civil society organizations. They know better than anyone else and we have uh, experienced that so far. Thank you very much, uh, Aldiana. So now I would like to, to move to um, our next uh, uh, panelist and uh, she is Dr. Princess Notemba Simelele. She's the Assistant Director General for Strategic Programmatic Priorities and Special Advisor to the Director General of uh, the World Health Organization, another action coalition uh, leader. Uh, Dr. Simelele, what I would like to ask you is, what strategies do you think are critical to support the scale up of coordinated survivor-centered 
comprehensive, quality, accessible and affordable services for survivors of gender-based violence against women and girls in all the diversity, including in humanitarian settings. You're having the floor, Dr. Simelela. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kaliopi. And I'd just like to acknowledge uh, every panelist as well as the people participating in this. And um, just to say, on behalf of the World Health Organization, who's co-leader of this action coalition, it gives me a great pleasure to respond to this question. In fact, I would want to delete the word pleasure because it's a sad situation that you should, in the 21st century, be asking how we could scale up um, support for women who are violated, who are abused, and who are beaten up by, a part, by their partners and or by other men in society. This is an, a, a phenomenon that should have been really disappeared from the face of the earth. But here we are, we still have to deal with it. So here are a few things that WHO and our partners, the member states, um, think about this. The recent prevalence estimates published by WHO show that nearly one in three women is subjected to physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner or sexual violence by a non-partner. It's a number that is, has not changed for the last decade or even more. That then gives credence to the questions that our previous panelists asked. If we're doing all of these things and think we're doing them right, why is it that two decades, three decades, hopefully not four decades later, we're still answering the very same questions? So something is wrong in how we are looking at the narrative and how we are developing and implementing interventions. We've now seen how COVID has a double barrel impact on women. Its impact has really wiped out almost everything that women in informal uh, uh, sectors of work in many areas of the world just left unattended. Women in humanitarian settings also suffering because of the impact of a double uh, impact of COVID, as well as being in those confined, miserable, inhumane circumstances. We also know that violence is not acceptable. It shouldn't exist. It's preventable. And we really must now start focusing on rather the prevention um, instead of the reaction to uh, in, insults or impacts or violence that has already been perpetrated. What do we need to do to have this issue never enter the minds of a young boy, a young man ever in their lives? That is the question we all need to look for answers for. Violence causes enormous harms to women, to their health, their social well-being, and by extension, their families, communities, and the entire uh, country as it were. I mean, half the population of the world, a significant part of half of the population of the world suffering these insults. How can they be sustainable development when women are under such abusive conditions? The health sector, however, has a very important uh, place to, to play in contributing to things that we can do. We know that uh, we, we in the health sector need to be able to identify, to be able to provide care and support in all its forms for survivors of sexual assault and uh, survivors of, of, of uh, gender-based violence, and to be able to link them to other support uh, networks. It is in recognition of this critical role of the health sector that in May 2016, the 193 member states uh, of the WHO adopted 
as well as endorsed a global action plan of action on strengthening the health system's role in addressing violence against women and girls and against children as well. This plan highlights some of the strategies that are critical to support scaling up of services for survivors, including in humanitarian crises, including in violence against uh, women, in response health plans that we must include that component in the health plans, as well as in plans to achieve universal health coverage. Adequate staffing, appropriately staff, uh, uh, trained staff, and appropriately resourced staff must be available for women when they come in. Often they come in at night, often they, they come in with nothing, nothing to eat, probably not even well clothed, and the health system must be responsive. We must have protocols for delivering the best care and referral mechanisms that ensure that we can trace uh, without um, interfering with the, the, the confidentiality of the woman's life and data to ensure that she has reached the place where we have referred her to. Doctors must also see this as their role because it is not a duty just for nurses because most of the, the, the survivors are women. They can always easily walk off and say, well, you deal with this uh, because it's fairly embarrassing for them. We must integrate care services into health, but also into community-based uh, systems that have been spoken about in, on, on this uh, conversation, because that's where women eventually go back to. They cannot live in the clinic. They cannot live in the hospital. They go back to their homes. So that is where we must really have the sustainable, very much intertwined with the way the community lives, not just standalone um, interventions that actually stigmatize women when they go to seek care. WHO is committed to addressing violence against women by providing this support, but by working with any and all other partners who are committed to this issue. We must act with urgency. We must, we must, colleagues, be very angered by the fact that we're still talking about this. We really must promise the next generation that it will be less talk, but that on this day, in a year's time, most of us will not be in our homes, but will be on the ground doing the work and less of the talk. And that is the challenge that I pose to every single panelist and everyone listening to this um, conversation. Be on the ground working, and then let's leave other people to talk. Uh, let's, let's rotate uh, and be on the ground. I really want to urge you, on the ground is better because you see the impact immediately. It doesn't go through long bureaucracies. If you just hold the woman's hand, as she tells you her story, she's immediately feeling better. So on behalf of WHO, thank you. Let's continue. The fight is not over. The struggle is ongoing. And I wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Simelele, for this very inspiring call to action with very, very specific actions. And also, I really appreciated the fact that you emphasized the continuum between responses and services and support to survivors, and at the same time, the need for prevention and addressing the root causes of such violence. And I particularly appreciate it as well, the fact that we need to integrate such care systems into uh, the community systems in order to integrate, reintegrate survivors within uh, uh, their community. Thank you very much, Dr. Simelela, again. And now uh, we're having our uh, second um, poll question. Can we please uh, uh, share it in our screen? It's the second. 
Yes, thank you very much. So this question to, to probe a little bit your, your, your knowledge and what you think about uh, uh, what are the most urgent actions that they are needed to address gender-based violence? A, focus strategies to address all forms of GPV experienced by adolescent girls. B, address GPV that occurs in conflict, crisis, and humanitarian settings. C, address women and girls' multiple and intersecting experiences of discrimination and oppression, which occur as a result of uh, different uh, grounds that we see there. And D, all of the above. Please take a few seconds to, to vote and we can see the results. Okay, can we see the results, please? I hope we can see the results. Okay, very good. I see very clearly that all of the above. Of course, we know that violence against women and girls, they do uh, happen, they do take place in different settings. There needs to be a nexus between the development uh, humanitarian and conflict uh, context when we talk about uh, addressing violence against women and girls. And of course, women and girls that they have been facing multiple and intersecting uh, forms of discrimination in a systemic way, they need to be at the center of, of our um, interventions. Thank you very much for, for this uh, uh, second uh, poll. And then if we can uh, continue, if we can continue our panel, and I would like now to, to move to Mrs. Lana Fennekin, who's uh, the representative of the Global Coalition on Inclusive and Safe Cities and Spaces for Women and Girls, another action uh, coalition leader. And I would like to pose the following question to Mrs. Fennekin. How can the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence meaningfully contribute to building back better COVID-19. Ms. Finkin, you are having the floor. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, good, good evening. Good morning. Hello, Ms. Good morning, everyone. Um, Alicia. Okay, thanks. Our coalition is unique because we work on gender-based violence from multiple standpoints and diverse strengths in the women's movement. And I am from the Wairo Commission and one of the five organizations that made up for inclusive safe space is for women and girls. We are experiencing some challenges with the sound. Can we please restore the sound for Mrs. Fennekin? We are one of the CSO's co-leaders as in local action, local partner, community leader and culture that has been true throughout the women's movement. And with COVID-19, it is more true ever than now. COVID-19 has shed light on existing inequalities and increasing incidences of violence against women and girls. It is in many forms. These are related to their identities also after of the hardest time accessing services legal, health, social support, etc. When the experience violence part of building back means acknowledging these inequalities and shedding light on the shadow pandemic. The Action Coalition can support work to shed light on the issues and make the connection with all, including that for survivors. Necessity for safe transportation, including essential workers, 
who are mostly women. It is also key for the Action Coalition to recognize effort by women. And I want to emphasize here the inclusion of grassroots women in responding to the emergency and who are already working on rebuilding and creating important space for their participation in drafting rebuilding plans and in advocating for a future free of violence against women and girls. As part of the world, we want or the post COVID new normal. In the face of such severe pressure and the increased social and economic vulnerability, COVID-19 imposed on grassroots women who have developed strong tools response to COVID including using digital and remote communication technology, but also people power. With women in Latin America, Caribbean, Africa, Europe, illustrating how they have activated and redoubled social networks, alliances and partnerships to cope with these pressures. Commission members in 45 countries describe how their public leadership roles in response by skill and of securing benefits in municipal plans, as well as public recognition for their leadership in COVID-19 response. One of the things we need to do by empowering and protecting and expanding women's access to and control of safe space and in responding to the COVID-19 challenges. The WIRO Commission came up with a special COVID-19 Community Resilience Fund to support our grassroots members overcoming different forms of gender-based violence in relation to their livelihood, food security, and a variety of hygiene, sanitation, and other health measures. One of the tools we use during the pandemic is the safety tool and community mapping to collect bottom up data that we share with the relevant government authorities and other partners for effective and timely response and support. And last but not regular and transparent information sharing and consultation with and participation in decision making for grassroots women's organization in political and economic decision making, designing programs, et cetera, and providing a space to allow for best practice exchanges to be shared and implemented by grassroots women. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Finikin, and especially for emphasizing the fact how we need to have to strengthen livelihoods and women's economic empowerment in order to also have an impact on addressing violence against women and girls. Thank you very much for these very good uh, uh, reflections. And I would like now to, to move to um, the next uh, uh, panelist, uh, Mrs. Sri Sofian. Senior Policy Advisor at the Global Coalition on Inclusive and Safe Cities and Spaces for Women and Girls, another Action Coalition leader. Mrs. Uh, Sofian, the question I would like to pose to you is, what can the Action Coalition on GBV do to ensure a genuine focus on addressing violence against women and girls in all the diversities? How should an understanding of women's and girls' diverse intersecting experiences of violence and discrimination be taken on board as we continue to develop and refine the Action Coalition blueprint? You are having the floor, Ms. Sofian. Thank you very much, Calliope. I hope you can hear me. Um, very good morning from Malaysia and um, good evening and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, Thank you again for this opportunity to be um, part of or a member of the um, GBV Action Coalition and also to be on this panel. 
uh, I will frame the, um, my response uh, with four points. Yeah. Uh, the first one is um, that um, we must commit to ensure a genuine focus on addressing violence against women and girls in all their diversity. We need to normalize the voices of all women and girls as powerhouses in spaces where they are not typically heard. Um, work with the media to shift the way that men and women are portrayed, work in workplaces, particularly formal and government institution, to disallow the prominence of only men voices and promote not just girls and women, but also the weight of their opinion, their skills and experience. Uh, for the Huayru Commission and all members of the Global Coalition of, uh, for Inclusive Safe Spaces and Cities, uh, we, we are made of six organizations. Yeah? Um, it is important to include and hear voices of organized grassroots women working to eliminate and prevent gender-based violence. Um, and they, they work at the community and local level. They have proven practices and tools, uh, and they must be at the decision-making spaces with tools such as community mapping, uh, safety audit, the safety pin application, and several other uh, applications that has now come on board. Yeah? Um, social audits, local-to-local -local dialogue, gender-based uh, budgeting, uh, and research and study methodologies, and many more tools. Yeah? Grassroots organization and their partners have generated large database of knowledges, uh, championing and highlighting and continue to work to, to ensure um, cities and spaces developed and operated to be safe for women and girls in all their diversity. Uh, and this should be reflected also in public policies that value partnership with citizens and their constituency who are focused on co-producing gender just equitable local development that benefit for all. We, we must strengthen collectives of women uh, to be at the policy table. Their agency and perspective should lead the way. Yeah, this is very, uh, it, it is a commitment that we must make to move forward. Secondly, it is key to change mindset and take action urgently for change. Partnership and resources are critical. So put resources in the hands of women's group. Yeah, um, I totally support and like the key, the, uh, the, the point that uh, Adriana made the key point on increased core funding and flexible resources for women's organization and grassroots organization. Invest in grassroots leadership and organizing, which is at the very bottom level where it impacts directly their community and you know, uh, it, it transcends upward as well to the larger society. Um, and um, we must invest in their leadership and organizing because they work with young women. Yeah? Community-based and grassroots women are agents of change and partner of development. They are not beneficiaries. Remember that. So to move forward and to make sure that we eliminate and prevent gender-based violence, they are key constituency, they are key partner, they are key player and action. Actors, sorry. The third one. My third point is we must be non-negotiable in our insistence on using intersectional approach. It is harder and definitely requires more resources, particularly given the data gap. But it provides nuance and allow us to operationalize the principle of leaving no one and no place behind. When we talk of whole government, of, of whole society uh, approaches, 
we must disaggregate women and women, not just by their vulnerability, but by importantly as asset, as agent of change, as doers that can, you know, transform how our society is going to be in the future. Um, we need data disaggregation by sex, age, disability, location, income, social group, ethnicity, and other relevant characteristics. This is to track impact on and respond to support the poorest and the most excluded, the, those who really need support. We must ensure that women's rights organization, especially community-based and grassroots women's group, you know, organized grassroots women's group, are partners in the collection of this data and that data are used to inform policies and interventions. Now, last but not least, it is time for us to move beyond a siloed approach and integrate the elimination of gender-based violence across all ministries and not just place them you know, with ministries of women or social welfare um, or family. Fund for line, fund line ministries in sectors that have a critical role to play in policy development and program implementation that would have impact to eliminate gender-based violence and to prevent gender-based violence. Yeah? Um, so uh, that's the key point that I want to make um, during this panel. And I look forward to all of us making joint commitment yeah? uh, because only jointly and in partnership, we can make that change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Sofian, for these very, very good reflections. And I really want to emphasize what you said about the role that grassroots organizations can play and how they contribute to the knowledge building. So when we are talking about evidence-based interventions, we are not talking only about the golden um, evidence, if we can say, um, of uh, interventions, but also what is coming from the practitioners. So it can be practitioners-based knowledge and evidence as well that can inform our interventions. Thank you very much for, for this. Um, I'm afraid we don't have that much time left. So I, I would suggest that uh, we already move to uh, some uh, um, questions and answers. We received a lot of comments and a lot of uh, questions. Unfortunately, we have to pick up only a couple that our panelists could uh, respond to. One uh, question is, um, how can we include social innovations into the strategies to address violence against women in order to leverage change? If any of the panelists would like to address uh, these uh, questions, please appear in, in the screen or raise your hand so you can have the floor. Anyone from the panelists? It's the question is about investment into social. Can you repeat that question again? How do we include social innovations? into the strategies to address violence against women to leverage change? I, I think, I mean, let, let me try um, to respond to that. Um, I think it is about, you know, seeing and looking at out of the box on how we, we, we address and we prevent and um, uh, um, what do you call that, create awareness about preventing violence against women. So use, you know, um, uh, the arts um, and, and, and like in Jamaica, they have been doing a lot with theater and so on. So, um, and, and providing some resources for also groups, especially young people uh, and also older women, you know, uh, to also work uh, together and create partnership. And I think government have to come also and support them and acknowledge their role in this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if any other uh, panelists would like to come in to address uh, um, this question. 
Otherwise, another question that uh, our audience sent us is uh, <clears throat> on how should one work with men so that they question themselves about the use and abuse of power, as well as the mechanisms of domination that are deployed in their environment. Would any of the panelists like to address this question? I'm sorry, I don't see. I see Lana uh, on the screen. Lana, would you like to address this uh, question? Can you repeat for me? I did not hear that question. Are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you. The question was, how should one work with men so that they question themselves about the use and abuse of power as well as the mechanism of domination that are deployed in the environment? It's a long question. So, well, I know, but um, for me in Jamaica, um, it goods Jamaica and Sister in Theater Collective, in our organization, we have a program called um, Men on the Corner, and that look at gender-based violence and get them to participate and become ambassadors for spreading the message to other women, other men on other corners and across Jamaica. And um, it has been very successful, run for three years, and we still have men groups and parenting groups that are now grooming boys in ensuring that they don't um, deal with women and, 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 and abuse women and abuse their girlfriends, etc. So it can happen. Thank you so much, uh, Lana. Are there any other colleagues who would like to come in and share some uh, reflections? I see Diana appearing on the screen. Diana, would you like to come in? Yeah, I think there's a question about how can we ensure that investments go to the grassroots um, women organization. Um, and I, Sri has addressed some of that, uh, but I also wanted to make sure that we speak about particular importance of investing in women's funds who are you know, there as a sort of bridge to invest in the grassroots organizations um, particularly, you know, Global Fund for Women, Mama Cash. Uh, we have seen some great work of these organizations working with grassroots. We in the trust funds have, in the trust fund, have also worked with Madre, for example, organizations play themselves as a human rights organizations, but they work very um, much on women's rights and with women's organizations, particularly with, on the indigenous issues. And through them, we have invested in a number of indigenous grassroots organizations. So I think that is a very important question about investment in grassroots organizations and those are the community local level who, you know, as we've been saying all the time, you know, they know what the, what the job is. They know what they're doing. They know what the context is. They know what the demand is. And we just need to make sure you know, um, that they, they do have equitable access to equitable resources, that they do have access uh, to the resources that will allow them to build their core and the institution that, you know, it, it was very easy during the COVID to just pack a computer and go home, but that not every organization has computers or mobile phones. And I'm mean, talking about moment of crisis. So I think those hows are, are, are very much important to be answered. Uh, particularly when it comes to the grassroots and local and community organizations. Uh, back to you, Calliope. Calliope, if I may also uh, respond to that question. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I think, you know, um, I appreciate what Ajana says about the trust fund and all um, that have been, you know, very important uh, in, in, in supporting and resourcing a grassroots uh, organization. But we, we need to also build the capacity and help with the capacity of how these grassroots women in their application process. Sometimes, you know, they have all the, the knowledge and they can do the work and implementation on the ground. 
but they need help with the application process that is lengthy, that is so bureaucratic, that you know, access that make accessing this fund impossible. And you have a threshold that you know, oh, you have to have a, uh, for example, you have to have a annual fund of 150,000. And they are just starting, they only have 50,000, you know? And how do we, you know, go to this group? look for this group that actually have proven um, um, track record at the local level because smaller smaller groups that we pull together will make a great change so you know we have to remember that remember that pulling smaller groups together giving them opportunity to interact and learn peer uh, through peer learning you know and 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 for Hawaii commission and its member we have what we call the grassroots academy you know through this kind of methodologies and and then build their capacity why are not we 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 support them uh, to to write a proposal to um, um uh, manage funding and and then the other thing is that everybody needs to be audited you know the cost of the audit itself you know is sometimes very um challenging for them to even find uh, such person. they they are honest they do the work on the ground and, and in most, most cases they are most honest so i think those are two points that i i just want to to make here and this is something that the mindset of funders you know, changing mindset of funders and those that we work with, including government. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Very, very important points indeed. Uh, we are getting close to to the end, I'm afraid. So I would like to close that panel to thank all of you for this excellent interventions and the discussion and the additional uh, reflections. And I would like to um invite again Mrs. Hannah Christian Dottir to come and share with us about the, the next steps uh, regarding the action coalitions and moving towards uh, Paris and the Generation Equality Forum there. Hannah, you are having the floor. Thank you so much, Calliope, and thank you so much for your excellent moderation on this important panel. And thanks to all our leaders and participants for our rich and inspiring conversation. It's obvious that this is an issue that is close to all of our hearts and it gives you hope that we will actually be able to move things and make great results for this important issue in the coming five years. But as mentioned earlier, uh, we are now heading towards the, the launch of the Action Coalition, the formal launch of them in Paris. The, we are now in Mexico, and that is what we call the kickoff. Uh, and these we have now introduced to you the actions that we are going to move ahead with. And we are urging and asking and making sure that everybody knows that we are now in the process of the leaders introducing their actions and them offering everybody to join as commitment makers. And they will play a catalytic role in the success of the Action Coalition, not just the gender-based violence, but all of the other ones as well, by making hopefully groundbreaking commitments and contributing to the finalization of the blueprints that we have been introducing as drafts, and we are of course really proud of. And we want to move now, and if we could see the next slide, where you will see what we are asking of our great commitment makers. And we are going to introduce how one can become involved in the action coalitions. And this is what we're getting a lot of questions around. And we are thankful for that and hopeful that we can answer those questions. Because as we showed you in the beginning, the leaders are already in place. We have 95 leaders. But now we are moving into the next phase of uh, opening to commitment makers. And the commitment makers are us to make bold and transformative commitments to one or several of our action coalition. Many will be involved not only in one action coalition, but several. And that is something that we really like and hope that uh, everybody that wants to join will join for more than one. 
They are being asked to play a catalytic role in supporting the implementation and monitoring of actions that have been introduced here today and are being introduced in Mexico. And they are also being asked to mobilize other stakeholders around the Action Coalition theme and the blueprints. And then we get the question of who can become a commitment maker. And this is what gives us great pleasure to be able to say everyone can and everybody is asked to be joining the, the commitment maker models. And this includes uh, in the same way as the leaders, it includes women's and feminist organization and movement, civil society actors. Of course, we want to see a balance in the global south and north. This also goes for international agencies and regional organizations, private sector entities and philanthropic organizations, youth-led organizations. And let me tell you, because I know we have youth really, really heavily involved in the Mexico Forum, uh, that they have been sort, sort, sort of force for catalytic chains, and they have actually been sort of the provider of real power within this. So let's make sure that youth is really heard in this work for the Action Coalition. And then, of course, the governments that have been joining us, the member states, they are also being offered to become a commitment maker. And what is expected? Because th that is also the question we get. It's not just about financial commitments, although we of course want to see funding uh, allocated to the commitments, but it's also about advocacy commitments, policy commitments, and programmatic commitments. And they should be, dear friends from around the world, our commitments or the commitments should be game-changing, measurable, and ideally designed with other stakeholders. But most importantly, they should be beneficial for women and girls around the world, so we can actually make the changes that we want to see in the world. And for on these notes, I would like to close and just thank everyone for great conversation. Thanks to Mexico and the government of Mexico for hosting. Looking forward to the path ahead to Paris. Thanks to all our partners for all that they have, have done. Thanks to the leaders of this Action Coalition and for all of you for being so enthusiastic and promising for the road ahead. So thank you so much over and out and over to you, Calliope. I think you're muted, Calliope. Yes, I unmuted my, myself, thank you. Um, no, thank you for this really promising uh, words. I really have to say that personally, I'm really hopeful and convinced, having seen all this energy and all these commitments, more than one year um, in uh, the recent past, that we are going to make it. We know that violence against women and girls is preventable. We know that if we join forces and if we collaborate and coordinate among ourselves, we can make it. And if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? I will leave you with these thoughts. I hope you can join us for the proposed commitments and also to come up with your own commitments in order to make this agenda a reality. And we're looking forward to see you again in the Generation Equality Forum in Paris. Have a nice day or a nice evening. Bye-bye.